Welcome to Straight Talk about conscious business collaborations. And I'm really excited today because today I have with me Mark Cordius. And he's a brilliant businessman. And he's also a very conscious businessman. And that's why I'm really excited to have him here with you today. So welcome, Mark. Hello. Thank you, Carly. Welcome. So I'm actually going to let people, I want you to actually give to people a little bit about who you are. <laughs> What is it about you that you understand a little bit about conscious business collaboration principles? Sure. Well, um, I feel like collaboration has always been a part of my life, uh, especially since transitioning from uh, 20 years in the business and marketing field into the transformation industry. I have found that the, the fastest way to help build my audience is actually through collaboration with other joint partners. Uh, and, and one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that although I'm solely responsible for the success of my business, I know there's no way that I can do it alone. The building uh, partnerships really is the, the keystone to uh, how fast I've been able to build my business and something that I really try to help other people understand that uh, building relationships, just like in life, is the, the key to your success. And everything that you do in life requires uh, other people in order for it to work properly and pretty much everything that we do affects other people as well so we want to be very conscious about how we affect other people and the relationships that we build. Now you and I talked previously before we got on this call and we're also going to be expanding into talking about visionaries so what is actually what does visionary actually even mean to you? That's a great question and I, I think it, it means something different to everyone. Um, what I look at is somebody who can see uh, something that is not there. It's not even seeing outside of the box, it's seeing that there's no box at all. You know, really being able to have innovative new ideas to help you achieve your mission, uh, whatever your goals are in life. And uh, a visionary is somebody who, obviously using the word vision, has uh, this picture in their mind of where they want to be and what they can see. And it can, it can be, there's all different types of visionaries, uh, but it's finding innovative solutions to the problems that we're facing right now. Now, I would, well, for me, I've always looked at it as there's always a both and. And it's also seeing all points of view, being flexible enough to see other people's perspectives. And one of the things I love doing is taking a picture. And I'll actually take, for example, I took a picture in the middle from a train station platform. And I got a picture of the buildings way in the distance and the sky above it. And below that, there was all this traffic. And then I actually put it on Facebook, and I actually put up this, this like really amazing just kind of inflow conscious piece, and I asked people, what did they see? And it was interesting to have people come back, and some of the people's comments were they saw the clouds, and some people say they actually saw the buildings in the distance, and some people actually got stuck on the traffic. You know, so it's just seeing one picture that was actually really beautiful, actually, because it was really it was panoramic, from way on top of this train platform, right? Everybody saw something different. Absolutely, that's a great right? example. That's a still shot. And it, it was. It was this beautiful, and it was because I was way. It, I was doing a, a a shoot for a Hug Train, right? And I was on this platform, and it was and on the platform. Nobody was on the platform. It was perfectly still and silent, and I couldn't hear any of the traffic, right? So I'm way up on top there, and when I took the shot, I'm in stillness, silence, mm. right? And I could see the traffic below. I could also see way in the distance, beautiful. It was no clouds in the sky, beautiful blue still sky, right? I could see the beautiful tall buildings in the distance. I could see the trees in the distance. I could see this beautiful panoramic picture. And of course, as a producer and director, I'm looking at all the angles and the, and the, yeah. and the, the, you know, the skyscrapers. I'm looking at all this beauty. And so I'm always looking at angles and perspectives when I'm taking pictures. Mm -hmm. And then to actually take the picture and then actually ask people, what do you see? And I asked it in a certain way, what do you see first? Mm. And it was amazing to me to have what people saw first and how some people actually still got stuck on the traffic and the noise and right. didn't see the beautiful sky or the trees or the architecture of the city. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So that, again, what is vision? What is visionary to you? What are you building in your life? What are you building in your business? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's really neat that you see uh, pointing out the different perspectives. 
And it's important for us to have people around us that do look at the different perspectives to help us juxta our own position because otherwise we kind of, even with a visionary, we can see that there are other positions if we don't know what they are. Um, being able to see the trash sometimes uh, as visionaries, I think we get so um, looking at the grander, the bigger picture that we do forget about the trash. I know that's one of the problems that I have um, in just looking for improvements and looking for ways to tweak things, looking for problems that a, a lot of times my wife will be very observant and say, oh, well, what about this? And she'll point out all the things that I need to fix that I might have otherwise missed. And um, we were talking about collaboration and working as a team. One of the great leaders in, in our nation was uh, Abraham Lincoln. And we know that he surrounded himself with people who had different perspectives, uh, different beliefs and even different values, just so that he could have more input so that he could get a bigger idea of, of the whole perspective. And I, I think that's the same thing with, that I try to do, is to not uh, pigeonhole myself into having just one belief and to surround myself with people and not judge them for having different beliefs and allowing that in. Now you brought up a very valuable point and tool that I'd like to give to other people. When you're building your business, when you're building your team, you're building your collaboration. Now even this applies to JV, joint ventures. You must surround yourself with people that are going to, as you say, fill in the holes, if you will. If you build a team or if you build a collaboration or even a JV, and everybody has the same values or the same points of view, you're not going to have as much a success, a success as you would like. You need different points of view. As you said, your wife points out things to you that you wouldn't or normally see. You're going to need someone that may be the bean counter or the accountant that has that perspective. You're going to need someone that has the big picture, if you will. You're going to need someone that is going to be the more positive and really energetic, you know, creative type. You're going to need the different aspects. So you're having a team that's holistic, right? So you, mm -hmm. and there's actually different courses that will teach you the different personality types so you have a more holistic team. Because you have seven creatives or right. seven CEOs or seven CTOs. You know, so you, you can't have all CFOs or, or, or all C, you know, CEOs. You have to have, you know, as you know, a company is built up of certain positions for a reason. Because that way you have a whole. It's the same thing when you're building your team or who you surround yourself with. You want people that know a little bit more about things that you don't know. You don't want, you don't want to be the know-it-all. You want people to help you with things that you don't know. Absolutely. That, that's so right. In fact, when you say that, it reminds me of um, the, the three pillars that I talk about in business are the hands, the heart, and the head of the business. The hands is the technician, They're the person who delivers the service that everybody's paying for. The head of the business is the organizational structure of the business, the, the back end, the, the technical part of it, the, the stuff that I am challenged with. And a lot of us I think, in, in the transformation industry challenged with that part of it. And then there's the um, actual head, uh, the heart of the company, which is the entrepreneur, the, the creative spirit that you're talking about. And when you're doing, uh, when you're a solopreneur or an entrepreneur running everything by yourself, you usually are really good at one of those areas and maybe okay at another, and usually you're downright challenged with at least one of them. And if you're trying to do all of them, you can handle the things that you know how to do, and you can either hire or partner with people for the things that you don't know how to do. But you always miss all the things that you don't even know that you don't know how to do. So having that outside perspective at least can make you say, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. So it's really important to have that three-legged balance. And, and I love, for me, everything is trilogies. The, like you said, the three-leg, the, the stool. To me, the stool is such an amazing analogy. And for me, I always call it trilogies. And I, and I love that. Um, and I go back to you. For me and you, and I, and I, I that's why, I, that's why I, one of the reasons why I want, I've been wanting to interview you for so long because you really do get consciousness, and that's why one of my shows, that's why it's called We Plus You Conscious Business Collaborations. Because to me, whether people understand or understand it or not, energy is all around us, and underneath our unconscious and our subconscious, we do do business with values, ethics. 
whether we know that or not. We're doing things unconsciously, and we do have faith. We do have value. Underneath all these things, we're doing things from those places. <clears throat> so I love that you use the heart you know, and use that terminology. And so that's one of the reasons why I actually wanted to have a conversation with you about business from a conscious, more spiritual spin on it, even though that isn't everybody's, you know, kind of way of talking about it. I did want to go to that place. And it isn't for everybody, and that's okay, and I'm okay with that. However, I did want to go to that place. I didn't want to talk about the heart. I didn't want to talk about the brain. I didn't want to talk about those aspects of business because I think it's a really important thing. And there's a lot of people now that are actually starting to talk about business from that place. And there's a lot of companies that are do work from that place. A great company that works from that place, for example, is Southwestern Airlines. Southwest, excuse me, Southwest. If you look at their models, I mean, their logo is the, a heart, the wings. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, everything they do is about customer service. And if you, I've actually got to interview Colleen Barrett. And mm -hmm. their whole model, how they actually hire their, their people that work for them, is that you have to have spirit. You have to have heart. You have to care about the customers. And it's all about energy and heart and customer service, customer service, customer service. And it's not, you know, it's just a different mindset. And I think the more that we come back to that and come back to heart and customer service from a heart space, we will, we will actually see a different shift in business. Absolutely. And for me, it's such an important conversation to be sharing with you because I really believe that business can lead the way for uh, humanity's shift in consciousness, that, that they control the money, uh, they have such an influence on government, and that when we can shift the way that business is done, we can really address a lot of the, the crises and the problems that we face together uh, through as humanity. So conscious capitalism is kind of the, the response to create that. Uh, there's a lot of different, uh, there's compassionate capitalism and other variations of it, but the whole idea of conscious capitalism it really is based on, on a four tier. The, the first one is having a purpose bigger than yourself bigger than your company. The second one is having um, a stakeholder model where everybody as part of the company feels like they're part of the company. Not just the management or the owners of the company, the employees of the company, the vendors of the company, and even the customers of the company. And a great example of that would be Apple. You know, people who are Apple vendors, they're proud to be Apple customers. They're proud to be Apple vendors. They're, you know, they're proud to work for Apple. Even if they're Oh, but they're not at the Genius Bar, even if they're sales, whatever it is, you know, they, they love being there. And the same thing with Toyota. Uh, and like you were saying, uh, Southwest, they're all part, of, they're members of conscious capitalism. And so they, they have that stakeholder model, they have that purpose that's bigger than themselves, and they have conscious uh, culture within their company. The, 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 there's a, a culture that is more about how do we uh, interrelate and how does everything work together. And understanding that that culture creates a better customer service, creates a better experience for the customer, so it's a big part of it. And then the last part is about conscious leadership. And that's what we're here to talk about is you know, emerging visionaries as being the leaders. And there are many emerging visionaries in the uh, corporate world that are kind of leading the way in this conscious business aspect uh, and using a lot of the different tools that we're talking about today. The other thing I really want to address because it's really, really important is abundance, currency, money. Because we have, unfortunately, a lot of people that think that if you're spiritual, everything's free. It's kind of like you can't be wealthy and spiritual at the same time, that somehow that's greedy. And what, what people don't really understand, too, is like the universe never, it, it's kind of like you don't get, is that actually the more that you give in value, which is very true, you actually see that people are more than willing to actually give you. It's not like when you, it's like the more you give, now here's the thing, when you're giving, you're not giving with expectation of getting something in return. And you have to be in that mindset. Because if I give to Mark, I'm not giving to Mark with expectation of Mark giving me something. I'm giving because I'm choosing to give to Mark. There's a difference there. However, we are, where we're living right now, and the, and the planet that we're living right now, wherever you want to, you know, we are spiritual beings having the physical experience. And that physical experience at this moment in time that we're in happens to be currency and money. And, you know, that does, we have to honor the fact that, and, and Southwest, here's the thing, you know, they still make money. 
they they don't charge like everybody else. They they're not the most expensive airline, yet they are still making money. So that's the thing. There's a balance. What I'm getting at, there is a balance. And when you when you are someone that's ethical, when you're giving a value, immense value, okay, and you're you're giving people quality quality content, you are going to make money. That there's this whole like. I don't know, way out of whack balance that you can't make money doing what you love. And the way I look at it, I'm providing massive value to people, like literally giving quality content that I'm not supposed to somehow not get money. You know, and, and that I can't be conscious and I can't be spiritual, which to me is something that is completely out of whack and out of balance. I don't know how you feel about that. That I think a lot of people are struggling with that right now. It's like they, they want to have a heart, they want to be conscious, and they're they're struggling with the way of how to figure that out. And they and they feel guilty in asking for money. Have you seen that? All the time. Yeah, I think this is the probably the the, the primary issue that I address uh, with emerging visionaries is because so often these are people who give from the heart. Uh, they're social workers. They're people who are just very compassionate and want to help others but they so often struggle to take care of themselves because of that that whole mindset thing it's that putting the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on your your children and when, when the airplane is going down you know and the purpose for that is that if you can't take care of yourself you're not in a position to take care of anybody else and so many people are you know spend all of their energy giving 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 and not receiving that they it's like a dead battery you know they, they they burn out and then they're not able to to give at that capacity if you don't make money for what you're doing and what you're loving then you have to make money somewhere else so then you're spending energy doing something just to make money to so that you can do what you really love and help other people but if you can help other people and make money doing that <clears throat> you can spend more time helping more people and with the money if you make too much money that you feel uncomfortable with it you can donate it. You can use that. It's such a, such a powerful resource, and I love how you called it currency. Because if well, and the thing is, currency is energy. That's why I'm just like I'm like it's kind of funny. If you know, if you think about it, currency is energy. So if if you want to look at it that way, and if you're into spirituality and you get that energy is energy, energy is currency. It has to move. And, and, yeah, and it does need to move. And I always tell people this: the same thing. If you're really uncomfortable, like you said, earning money, I look at it this way, get wealthy enough to buy a forest, get wealthy enough to buy a country, or get wealthy enough to feed the country. So I, it's like I, and people are always, if you really want to do some good, get, well, get wealthy enough to do some good. So that, that, that's my point in terms of the guilt factor. And I think you sometimes know. people look at people with money and they think that they're they're bad or they're lesser for doing it. And so they're afraid that if they make a lot of money, then they're going to become like those people. And money doesn't change you. Money just makes you more of whatever you are. And if you're exactly. a giving person, money will just make you more able to give. Exactly. Now and then get, and now that goes back to the unconscious mind stuff that we grew up with, and that's that's what I'm talking about the whole unconscious subconscious stuff because a lot of times we don't even realize the stuff that we carry, you know, from from because from the time we're born we're hearing the arguments and the unconscious storytelling from our parents, and of course they got that from their parents. So it's this con this this constant evolution of storytelling and unconscious feelings and unconscious guilt that we're carrying over from whatever we grew up with. And so the, the key is, A, to start figuring that out. What triggers, you know, it's not just your triggers. It's triggers that you don't even realize that you have. So if you are feeling guilty around money, if you are feeling guilty about, you know, leaving your job and going to do something else, if you're miserable with the job you're doing, figure out why you're really miserable. Don't just go, you know, beating yourself up. Really look at why you're miserable. You really have to start looking at some of the stuff. You just can't live status quo in that rut anymore. Really look at it. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you're just going to be miserable for the rest of your life. And I don't think you really want to be miserable for the rest of your life. And you know, They say money can't buy happiness. I mean, we all know that that's true because I know lots of people with tons of money who are still not happy. And then they can find out, well, what is it that's missing? Uh, you know, the money doesn't make you happy. But money doesn't make you unhappy either. So it's not like you're going to uh, all of a sudden have money and then have these problems. You already have the problems. And so if you can do the inner work, and that's why I believe that with coaching uh, especially, but really whatever you're doing, it's important to constantly have two types of coaching or training mentoring. 
One is for personal development, to be the best that we can be for our being, just our experience. You talk about the human experience. And the other part is the doing. Uh, you want to have some type of coaching about your business, about what you do in the world, whether it's a hobby or it's supporting a, a nonprofit, being able to get outside teaching and training on how to do very effectively and how to be yourself. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. I don't care who you are, I encourage everybody to learn, play, and grow every single day. And everybody, everybody needs a mentor and a coach. I don't care how much money you're making, there's always somebody that knows more than you. There just is. I, I don't want to be a know it all. I don't want and I don't I don't want my life. In other words, no matter how perfect I may think I am, trust me, there's always something I can learn. And I, I welcome that. I welcome to learn from Mark. I welcome to learn from everybody. And there's always gonna be someone that knows some more than me. I mean technology is always evolving. Uh, you know, there's always something new coming out. There's always a new book being written. There's just always something out there that I'm not going to know. I can't know it all. There's just not. And as a matter of fact, when I have clients, they'll ask me a question. If there's something I don't know, I'm blatantly honest about it. I say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but guess what? I will do the research and I'll come back to you with an answer. Mm -hmm. Be willing to be honest about what you don't know. It's okay. You know, really, it's okay. Some people can be honest with, it with themselves. Right. You know, they, they have to hide it from themselves, and I, I've had that problem before. You know, we we try to be perfect sometimes, but if you can ex at least address it to yourself and say, "Okay, I don't know everything," the next step is to be able to do the same thing with not just your clients, but with your family, with your friends, and not to have to feel like you know all the answers, even about the things that are your specialty. There are people that know more about it, but there's also those things that are your challenge areas that you can always get better at. Well, think about it. Wouldn't it be kind of boring if we were perfect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I think I'd be, I like challenges. I like growing. So I don't know. I think I'd be kind of bored if I was perfect. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think the whole point to being on this planet, in all honesty, for me anyway, is we're here to learn. So I don't know. I think it'd be kind of boring. It, it, can you, it just be like we'd all be robots. It's that would be kind of a boring kind of planet if we were just all robots and everything was perfect. And I, I don't think it would really work. I think there'd be mass chaos if everything was perfection. That's just mm -hmm. my personal opinion. But anyways, I do want to let everybody know that we are on Intention Radio, and Intention Radio is a great place to go. Please go check out www.intention.com. Intention Radio, excuse me, intentionradio.com. And please make sure to go check out intentioncall.com. Great group of people that actually get together 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and you know they have great intentions. They actually pick something to tend upon, whether it's there's something happening that just happened. It could be anything. They they get together about um, world hunger, or sometimes it's about world prayer, or sometimes it's about love. Sometimes it's it's just they they actually tend about whatever it is every week. So actually, please go check them out. And we are going to continue this conversation because Mark is absolutely brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And um, I want you actually to actually share with everybody, you did write this wonderful book that I actually got to pursue and read. So actually, I'd love for you to share the title of that. And I actually would love for you to actually share a little bit about the inspiration behind that. So can you please share the title and where people can actually find it? And since this is a podcast, can you please share everybody the website where they can find you? Absolutely, definitely. My, my website is uh, right below my picture here, markporteous.com. And if you're just listening in, it's M-A-R-K-P as in Paul, O-R-T-E-O-U-S as in Sam.com. That's my website. Um, my book is also available there either for download or uh, I can send you a signed copy. The title of the book is The Human Experience. And it came from a quote that you were just uh, paraphrasing earlier, that we're not human beings having spiritual experiences, we're spiritual beings having human experiences. I first heard that quote when I was 21 years old. Uh, it was the very first time I ever went into a metaphysical bookstore in Orlando, Florida. And my girlfriend brought me in there just to kind of show me around. She knew I'd be a good fit. I was working for Greenpeace at the time. We both worked there. And, uh, again, I couldn't believe I was 21 years old hearing the word metaphysical for the very first time in my life, and now it's, you know, it's such a uh, ingrained part of, of, of my life. But uh, that that 
quote really changed my life because I had been writing poetry uh, about life, about relationships since I was 16 years old and didn't really realize the common thread. And it wasn't until I heard that quote that I realized that's what it is. That's what life is all about. We're here to have a human experience and all of these lessons that I've learned and I've written poetry about are all part of that story, a part of that journey. And so uh, uh, I'm re-releasing the book actually um, at the beginning of the year and it's going to be called Maximizing Your Human Experience. Uh, it's going to be seven, uh, the basically a personalized travel guide for your journey of life. And the reason I'm re-releasing it was because when I first uh, started writing the book 20 years ago, I got stuck uh, in the whole part of life of trying to um, get my life together first and then finish the book. And after 12 years in my last sales job, uh, I ended up having twins. That was three years ago. And when I had my twins, I realized that I couldn't keep deferring my life until I got everything perfect. I had to get it out now. Otherwise, I would teach my children to do the same thing, to put off what they were passionate about and kind of do what everybody else told them that they were supposed to do. So it was because of my children that I finally finished the book, but I, I was able to do that because of creating my first course. Before I ever knew I wanted to do, be a life coach, I created a course called Max Your Life to help me to be in integrity with what I was writing, with my own values. I, I knew what my values and my beliefs were, but I wasn't always practicing them. So this book really was a way for me to have a concrete, to be able to look at myself and say, okay, this is who I am and this is what I believe. But the course, the Manactual Life course, was created so that I could now take the steps to start you know, walking my own talk, basically. And uh, so that's kind of why the, the new title. So let's actually talk about your courses, because you and I are in on Facebook together, and we met on Facebook through some of the collaborational groups. So let's talk a little bit about that, because this is a really important factor in people actually learning about some collaborational business, and also learning about how they can find other people to joint venture with. And you and I are actually talking about a little bit of joint venturing and um, doing some collaborational stuff together, and that all happened because we met on Facebook. So let's talk a little bit about um, the group that actually that actually you um, created on on Facebook, and um, and what you're doing there. Are you talking about my group or the group that we met on? No, let's talk about because this is about you. So let's talk yeah, about your group. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, my group is called the Transformers Mastermind, and uh, it's all on my website. Again, I'm at markportius.com. I also have the transformersmastermind.com, so you can go there and, and learn about it. And this is where the whole question came up with you and I about what is a, an emerging visionary, because that's really what I'm looking for and uh, what I'm really excited to talk to you about, which is what is someone right before they emerge as a visionary? And I shared with you the story about The Matrix, and anybody who's seen the movie The Matrix knows the lead character is Neo, at the beginning of the movie, he's sitting in a, uh, an office, uh, and these people come in, and they're, they're telling him that he's special and that, that he's going to wake up and, and hear the truth. But all he has to do is take the red pill. And until then, he doesn't. He thinks he's, they've got the wrong guy. And so I think a lot of times we're all like Neos in some way. We, we know that there's a bigger vision for our lives. We know that there's a bigger truth than what we've been told. And it's just a matter of being conscious and waking up to that truth and learning how much power we have uh, to make a difference in the world. And it's through those two things I was talking about earlier, by taking personal development, uh, working on ourselves to be the best that we can be without judgment towards ourselves or towards anyone else, and to, uh, to be of service to others. It's really those two parts. Take care of yourself and be of service to others. So the Transformers Mastermind helps work on the how you can be of service to others and, as we were talking about before, be able to make uh, enough money to make a big impact, uh, make a, have a fantastic lifestyle, but also make a, a huge impact in the world. Now, how do people actually get in, like, involved in that? Do they actually go to your website? Do you have an intake form? Because that's one thing I found that's been a very big piece in the work that I do is, again, in other words, I've had Facebook, Facebook groups where people just let anybody in there. And then what happens is there's no there's no intake form to see how people are going to collaborate together. Mm -hmm. And so what I've wound up doing is I've actually not just let everybody in, I've actually done some sort of intake form to make sure there's not 
all CEOs or all CTOs or all, in other words, so that there is this, you know, collaborational thing that, that, so that people can start to find a meld of minds. So does, do you just allow anybody in or are you actually looking for a nice blend or how, how do you actually work your masterminds? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, it, it is a, a private group. Uh, it's a, a paid uh, group as well for the Transformers Mastermind. I do offer, like you, plenty of free content uh, for my community just by going to markporteous.com. Uh, you can opt in there, uh, register, and you'll get valuable content on a weekly basis. And you can also Facebook me as well at Mark C. Porteous. Mark Charles is actually my first name, but Mark C. Porteous. And I give lots of free content there. We have a, a community there of sharing and caring. But then the, the mastermind itself, uh, does, it is very selective. It's not just about anybody who pays can be a part of the group. Because again, we want to make sure that the your big why is a big part of it for me, is what is your motivation? And if you're just looking to uh, capitalize and, and serve yourself, then it's not really helping the group. And we really want people that are wanting to play together and work together, uh, basically doing collaboration, but that they're all doing it with that bigger goal in mind of making uh, some type of impact on other people's lives, service to others. So I think it's important to begin fit in that way but also, like you said, diversity. We want to make sure that there's people of all different thoughts and beliefs. Uh, spirituality is a pretty vague term. It doesn't mean that you're any particular religion. Uh, and there are people there that, that may not even know that they're spiritual uh, because of whatever background noise they have about spirituality, just like people have about noise or about, uh, about money. So all different kinds of people uh, takes to, to be transformers. But really, a transformer is anyone who wants to make a difference in their own lives and in the lives of others. Oh, I like that. So you are, that's good. So you are making sure that it's people that really want to play together and that there, there, there is that collaborative spirit, which I think is so important. Because it is very easy that people come in and, and then they, they pay the money and they don't do anything. And yeah, that becomes, um, that, that's no fun for everybody. Right. So. I'm really excited about that. So what else are you working on right now? Because I think you said you're working on one more thing. But I'm not sure. We to me and you have talked about so many things. So I'm like, which what else did we talk about? Am I missing what? something or did we touch upon did we touch upon the group? We touched upon the book. Am I missing something or did we, we capture on, on the main points? There's two little things. One that you and I are collaborating right now on the free tools for coaches. Okay. Oh, yes. I knew there was something. See? Yep. Uh, and, and that was, I don't know what day you're going to be airing this, but as of December 2nd, that'll be live through the end of the year. And that's uh, anybody who is, whether you're a writer, speaker, coach, uh, anybody with a message and you want uh, some helpful tools to help you get that message out louder and clearer, you can go to freetoolsforcoaches.com. Uh, and that's, again, a, a very small project just us, for us testing our waters together. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing other things with you. And then I also have uh, my Max Your Life program will be coming out in January. And, and the Max Your Life program is really about identifying those NEOs. It's kind of the first step before people uh, move into the Transformers program is really just uh, identifying themselves as visionaries and, and being able to, uh, it, it's kind of, me helping people decide to take the red pill and once they have done that and they realize oh wow I really do have an important message to share then the next step would be to move into the Transformers Mastermind and, and learn how to run it as a business. Okay so now, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend the rest of the show giving people some tips and tools we talked about a lot of things here so let's mm -hmm. start giving some people some nuggets let's start giving them some tips and tools on how to do some of the things that we've been talking about so let's give, let's start with going back a little bit, and let's start giving us some tips and tools on, for example, you were just talking about NEOs. So how would someone even go about to know if they even are a NEO? And, and again, that's, this is, uh, we could spend the next hour talking about that. Cause, uh, that's right. So I thought this would, we still, we have 20 minutes okay. left. Wonderful. So let's get into, I really want to give, leave people with some, some really good nuggets. So let's let's because you did. I think it's a really fascinating thing. I think a lot of people don't even know, like you said, 
you know, they, 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 so many people are unconscious right now. So I think you know, you and I are really good about. I think we are. We were really good at waking people up, just giving them little. It's kind of like you know, tap, 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 little taps on just waking people up a little bit. Mm -hmm. so I think I think it's really good to have you, you know have that little bit of a banter. So like just giving people some tips and tools on you know what what are some of the things people need to look for. Well, first of all, it. Um it's like you said, we're, we're just doing a tap, 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 and people have to really kind of be receptive to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it is. It's just the taps. We're, we're, we're not telling anyone what to do. We're not mm -hmm. telling anyone you have to do this or you have to do that. All we're doing is throwing out little seeds, little seeds that people can just actually listen to. And they may say, so you know, sometimes you listen to something and going, oh, my God. They have those little aha moments. All mm -hmm. I'm attempting to do here is put out little seeds, and maybe one of those seeds will be a little aha moment for somebody. And, and I really think that that's about that. How do you tune in to that message, really? Uh, and I think it's really about shifting from the head to the heart. Mm -hmm. we, we're so focused on thinking that a lot of times we outthink ourselves and and miss wonderful opportunities because we're not feeling with our heart and and, and listening to our heart. We're listening to our head, which is based on an ego that is there to protect us from any kind of harm. So we're always looking for harm where with our hearts we can look for opportunity, we can look for rainbows, we can look for sunshine and if we can follow that instead of being uh, avoiding the fear then, then we're tuned in to that frequency. And You have to have your radio tuned into the frequency in order to pick up the station. So it doesn't matter what I'm saying, if you're not hearing it, it's not working anyway. And I don't want to have anybody, I don't want to, like you said, tell anybody what to do. All my thing is, is listen to your heart and listen to what's coming from inside of you and I think everybody knows that there's more than, than what they're at right now. And you don't have to be a, a visionary leader. Uh, I, I talk a lot about leadership, but there's really three roles that you can play uh, as part of the shift in social consciousness. There is that leader role that's very important. There's also that support role. All leaders need support as well. And if you feel that that is your calling, then find out how you can be a better support to other leaders. Or maybe you're just a participant. Again, the participants are the soldiers. They're the ones who do all the groundwork, and, the, and it's crucial for a shift to come from the grassroots. And if you, if you, that's a great place to start, even if you don't feel like a leader or even a support role. That at least get in the game, be a participant, and and wake up and say, oh wow, there is more out there than what I've been told my whole life. Now I'm going to add something that you brought up that. That's going to be an amazing little maybe aha moment for somebody. A lot of people don't realize that your heart is your true inner GPS. We're taught so many times that our gut is our is our intuition, and it isn't. And you, like you said, a lot of people are stuck in their heads. They're also stuck in their guts because our culture has told us over and over and over again to trust your gut. Here's the problem with that. Our gut, by the way, is our flight or flee response. What happens in your gut? You get butterflies, you get nauseous, you get fear. Your gut is your fear response. Your heart is not. Your heart is literally your truest GPS. Your heart will never lie to you. Your stomach will freak you out. Your stomach will trick you every time. So I, I encourage you to listen to what Mark is saying about your heart. Get out of your head because your heart literally is connected to your stomach, and a lot of it is. It's connected to your stomach. And if you go back to ancient times when they were hunters and gatherers, and the reason why they the, the gut, okay, all the all the blood drains from your from your brain, by the way, to go to your arms and your legs so you can actually run like hell to get away from the bear. Yeah. And so when you're in that space, you're not even thinking rationally. Literally, because the oxygen has actually left your brain to go to your arms and legs so you can get the hell away from the bear. So you're in flight and flee response. So when you're on stage and you're freaking out and you're getting the butterflies or you're getting nauseous or something has happened and you're feeling, and everyone's going, well, trust your gut, trust your gut. That's not your true inner, that's not your inner tuition. It's not. Your heart, your heart, your heart, your heart is your inner GPS every single time. Trust your heart. So I just want to throw that in there. So just so you know, anytime you're having that kind of butterfly feeling or you're in fear mode of any kind, all the blood, even now, even today, even in 2013, the blood leaves your brain and goes to your arms and legs. It still does. And you're having lack of oxygen. You're not thinking clearly, just so you know. 
<laughs> it's a funny fact, but it's a true fact. And, and so, I'm glad you threw in the word fact. Huh? You, you just used the word fact, and I'm really glad that you did, because it, it can sound like jargon sometimes, to, that, that, oh, your heart is the, the GPS, but it's an actual scientific fact. There's all kinds of scientific research that shows that your body actually responds, your heart responds in many cases before your, your brain does. It does. It's a medical scientific fact about the flight or flee response with your stomach, and it's really funny. And your heart does respond before. And it's just, it, it's when, <laughs> whenever I tell people about the blood leaving the brain going to, they're like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's still, I mean, it's still 2013, but yes, it still happens. And whether, yep. that, whether the hunter and gatherers from AD, that still happens here in 2013. It's still it's, that's still what happens when you go into fear mode. So, and, uh, yeah. Again, this is a, a wonderful topic too. It just brings up so much. The whole idea about living in fear, and the, the idea of news. I mean, news is a product that people buy and they consume it because our brains are wired. The amagata looks for fear all the time, and it's because of that little teeny piece in our brain that we're at the top of the food chain. But it's also, we're still evolving. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, they hear the word evolution, and they think, yes, we are evolved, as if it's done now. And we're, we're still growing. And I think that's the biggest shift that we can make in evolution, is to shift the way that we think. We don't want to stop thinking with our head. It's very important to keep our, our head thinking, but not to make that as our primary source. If we can use our heart as our primary GPS and use the head as backup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly, because you know what? Our brains does give us information. The key is to filter it with our heart, because our heart is literally going to give us the nuance, in other words, of is it a true, a, you know, it's more of your filter. How can I put this? It's your, it's your truest filter. So mm -hmm. take the information you're getting, don't get me wrong, but use your filter, because you got to remember, it's still our perception. Right. I mean, we create our reality. It's still our perception, but still use your heart to filter in information. Does that make sense? I think that's perfectly said. In fact, you know, when you hear something, you were talking before about if it makes you feel butterflies. That's right. a great red flag. Okay, now, now I'm realizing that. And however it makes you feel, I think that if you can take information and then process it and not say, oh, it makes me feel bad, it's bad, or, but just acknowledge however information makes you feel and process it through your heart, that you'll be able to make a more sound decision. That was that was eloquently said. It is. It's how you feel. Because you gotta remember, it's how you're feeling. It's not what the other person now you gotta remember too, we are responsible for our feelings. And you gotta remember our feelings are our own baggage. And that's that's you know, this is like an endless pen. It's like how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? <laughs> this is like a never ending conversation because again, it's our reality. So Mark can't make me do anything, and Mark can't make me feel bad. It's my responsibility to take my feelings and deal with them. So it's not Mark's fault. If Mark says something to me, now I have the choice to react or respond, right? All feedback, no matter what he says to me, I can take his feedback and go, he's being an idiot or you know mean or whatever, because whatever he says to me is my reality, my perception. Okay. Now again. He also has a choice in how he how he chooses to say that same sentence to me. That's you know, that's the thing. This is a Pandora's box of Pandora's box because again, communication. That's the, that's the other thing. Communication is a huge thing. One sentence that is said, the old telephone game can go around, and what was said here comes out completely different on the other end. And one sentence. That's the other thing about texting, by the way, or typing. One sentence. One little letter out of context changes the whole sentence mm -hmm. okay so one sentence that's read by 20 different people could literally be 20 different meanings for 20 different people so it, it is everyone's unique perception and it's only our perception that actually really matters at the end of the day so that's what I'm saying how far down the rabbit hole you want to go <laughs> Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Go as deep as you want. Okay. We have 15 minutes left. That's fantastic. <laughs> I told you this would be fun. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, you're, you're wanting to share some nuggets, and, and I think that uh, one of the things that I like to share with everybody, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, is about relationships. You, were, uh, you brought it up just now when you were talking about communication. 
because I really believe that communication is so important, and there's so many different ways. We, the primary way that we communicate is through our voice, through talking, but people don't realize all the subtle communication that we've received, whether we're aware of it or not. Uh, eye contact, all kinds of other little things. My wife can read an email, and she can intuitively pick up the vibe of what people are really saying. So I, I'll send her emails for review. They're like, wait, what do they really mean here? But the way that we communicate, I think just being conscious of it is very important. And realizing that in any communication, there's two parties. There's the encoder, the person who's communicating, and then there's the person who's receiving, the decoder. And in any, in any communication, the encoder is 100% responsible for that communication. They may not be able to control that the other person has misunderstood it, but they have to understand that that person didn't understand what I was saying. So we need to be responsible, especially as, as visionary leaders, in the way that we communicate to make sure that the message that we're trying to get across is actually what's being received. And we can do this in a number of different ways, but the best is to get feedback and to say, here's what I'm saying, what are you hearing? And I think you, you started it very well at the beginning of talking about your picture. What do you see first? And when you ask people, okay, I just said this, what did you get from that? Not what did I say, but what did you hear from that? Really helps you as a communicator to be better as that encoder and, and getting better at understanding how people will perceive your words. And that if you can just be open to that, you'll improve your communication uh, just by taking responsibility for it and that you'll become better in every aspect of your life just because you'll have more uh, have better quality relationships. Absolutely, and you actually said that beautifully, and it is absolutely true. It is our responsibility to make sure that whatever we're saying is being perfectly understood. It's not the other person's responsibility. We're the person that's actually writing the email or actually delivering the speech. Mm -hmm. We are the person that if we're getting paid to deliver something, especially if we're being paid to speak, mm -hmm. that our speech is being able to be understood, understood by anybody that's in that audience. And yes, that's a tall order. <laughs> However, we have to do the best that we can. And it's the same thing when we're delivering an email. Now, in an email, it's even trickier. And I love that your wife can do that. It is, it is, it's an intuitive thing. And that's the thing. Here's, we are all intuitive. We have to, you know, we're, and we're all psychic. We don't think that we are, but we are. You have to, ta here, that's the thing that goes back to your heart. Listen to your heart. When you're reading an email, tap in, check in, listen. Listen with your eyes. I tell people this all the time. I can't believe, begin to tell you how much your eyes will tell you. Body language. When you, when you introduce to somebody, before you even shake their hand, take the time to look in their eyes and look, literally, take the moment to scan their entire body without literally scanning their body. Take with just actually looking at them. This is an actually exercise you can actually do without actually moving your eyes. Take their whole body in. Mm -hmm. Are their arms crossed? Are they open to receive? Are their palms open? Are their hands turned out? If their hands are turned out facing backwards, they're not open to receive. If their palms are open facing you, they're open to receive. If their arms are crossed like this, Trust me, they're not going to hear a thing you have to say. Are their heads doing this? Are their heads doing this when they're talking? You know, seriously, body language is fascinating. Take a course on body language. Take a course on neurolinguistic programming. There's so many things you can learn by studying communication. It's a fascinating subject. I love, I love, I love the, I, I mean, seriously, go take a course by Bob Berg. Read his latest book, um, Adversaries into Alleys is all about communication. It is a marvelous, fascinating book. I mean, there's so many books out there that you can actually study about communication. And but I highly recommend that book. That is a fascinating book about communication. I, I'm not familiar with it, so I'll make sure to check it out myself. Thank you. Oh my God, Bob Berg's book, this latest one that he just this is a brand new book, just came out uh, about two weeks ago. But the, um, he's written many books, but this book in particular is fabulous about communication. It's I mean one of his best books he's written besides The Go-Giver. Oh, he's written so many books. But anyways, that one in particular about communication is, is absolutely amazing. Um, highly, highly, highly recommend it for anyone who wants to know about communication and body language and responding versus reacting and anything you want to know.
And that, but that anyways, seriously, scan the person's entire body. In my course, that one that I, that I was using for that package, I talk about this. It scan the entire body. Your eyes are fascinating. You, we think we only listen with our ears. You can listen with your eyes. And watch what their eyes are doing. Exactly. Are they taking you in? Are their eyes going all over the room? Are they, you know, are they, are they distracted? What, you know, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, there's so many different aspects to communication. That's why he's got so many different books on it. Is because there's so many different things you can look at. Just words in general uh, are are symbols. Just like money is the symbolic of the energy flow, uh, words are symbolic of uh, your intention of what you're trying to convey. And the word can have different meanings. So being very clear about how you deliver your message, <clears throat> I think, is really really important. And the words that you use. Uh, are very, very powerful. Uh, using empowering words rather than detracting words, I think, is another way that you can improve your communication. Words that I personally don't use are should-haves, could-haves, would-haves. Another one is I personally don't use TRY because when we're using TRYs, we're not literally going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And another one is, which I find now, some some speakers still will use it for effect. I personally don't like to use it, but it's kind of like saying to Mark, "I love you, but," versus "I love you and." When when someone hears the word "but," it actually stops their field of energy. They're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Versus if I say "I love you and," they're still knowing something else is coming after the "and," but it's a softer blow. It's kind of like they still, you know, you know, can you feel the difference in subtlety? But if I tell Mark, "I love you, but," It's kind of like, whoa, what do you mean you love me but? Now, there are still speakers that use the word but for effect. It's kind of like to stop the audience. Mm -hmm. Now, I still disagree with it only because I, because of, because of spirituality and energetics that I studied. I studied the, the energy of words. I have still seen people's bodies literally undulate from the actual effect of hearing it. So mm -hmm. I, I won't use it. I replace all BUTs with A and D. So I replace all buts with ands. In my speech, and if I catch myself saying it, I immediately will say "and." That's just my own personal preference. There's still uh, a lot of people that still use it. No, I'm the same way with "but." "But" is one of the words that I uh, try to avoid at all costs. And again, it just totally negates everything that you said before. Once you hear "but," it's like, oh, well, none of that means anything anymore. Another thing is uh, "can't," like oh, "can't wait." I, uh, one of the examples actually that I use in my book, The Human Experience is when I was 11 years old, I lived with my dad and my stepmother, and I was telling her about camp. And I told her that I was so excited, I was really getting anxious, I couldn't wait. The first thing she corrected me on was that anxious doesn't mean excited. Anxious usually means fearful of, um, that you're not looking forward to it. She said, the word you probably want is eager, not anxious. And so that was my first vocabulary lesson of the day. But the other one was can't wait. That when you say you can't wait, that means that you're impatient and that you need to have it now, and that's a lack of acceptance of what is, and it's not living in the now. So now I don't use the word, I can't wait to see you. I say, I am looking forward to seeing you. And looking forward is a projection that you will see them rather than a fear-based thing of, oh, I'm not able to wait. Now, can you imagine if we had a preschool, and in preschool we were teaching our children this, semantics on words. People don't realize the power of our words. Everything we say in a weird way energetically is a prayer. And so we're putting out to the universe what it is that we want, what it is that we're seeking, what it is we're projecting. So imagine if we actually start doing that with our children when they were little, from the time they were babies, that when we were communicating with them, they were actually hearing those empowering words, that they grew up with that from the time they were babies. That's such an empowering thing. Yet we grew up with what we grew up with, and now that we're here, we're having to rechange. Now as adults, we're having to rechange our language. We're having to reframe our language. So we're re re we're relearning. You're actually in a wonderful position to raise your twins from a very empowering place. That is such a blessing. It really is, and that that's why there's so many children now that just don't have all that baggage uh, that we got to work through and all, all of those things. So, uh, it's very exciting for me to think about what they're going to be working through and how they're going to be evolving without all this crap to work through. Isn't that wonderful? That, yeah. that truly is a blessing. I mean, it really is. It's just such a, a, a wonderful, as, as a new, you know, the new thought 
schools that are coming up, the Montessori's and the Waldorf's and, and you know, the preschools that are coming out and public school systems don't have a lot of it. Um, I wish they did. Um, but it, it is wonderful to see the new parents that are learning the new parenting skills and the new conscious, there's so many new conscious parenting programs and it, I really look forward to seeing some of those kids grow up. I think it's such a marvelous thing and I, I mean, I'm, kudos to you and, and your wife and and your and your twins. I mean, that's just. I mean, honestly, that's such a blessing. What are some final thoughts that you'd love to leave the audience with, and some final nuggets? Well, I, I really want people to just uh, think about themselves for themselves. Uh, take take personal responsibility for your life and no one else's. We can't change anybody else. So if there's something that you want in your life. If people uh, are not communicating with you the way that you want them to, look at the way that you communicate with others. You can't do anything about other people, but you can change yourself. So if you really just focus on what you want and give that, you'll find that you get that back in return. So if you're wanting some type of change in your life, if you're wanting to live a bigger, fuller life, surround your yourself with people that are doing it. Work for yourself on being that. If you start with a place of being, then everything that you do in life will be inspired action. But just think about who you really are, and get in touch with your core values, peel back the onion and get rid of all the garbage of what everybody else expects you to be, and just kind of uh, center in and get anchored with who you really are, and be that, and then all the doing will take care of itself. Thank you so much for joining me. Please let everyone know where they can find you once again, please. Absolutely. My website is markporteous.com. That's M-A-R-K-P as in Paul, O-R, T as in Tom, E as in Edward, O-U-S as in Sam. .com. And I look forward to many more conversations, and thank you so much for joining me and taking time out of your busy schedule. Absolutely, Carly. I'd love to see you and talk to you anytime I can. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. You've been with your host, CarlyLissaThorne.com. Please make sure you go check out IntentionRadio.com and in the IntentionCall.com. And I look forward to being with you again. Have a great night, everyone. Blessings to everybody.